Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. This week we're covering Book One, Dawn of the Xenogenesis Trilogy by Octavia Butler, and we're looking at chapters seven and eight from part two, Family. My name is Richard Acton, and my co-host is Michael Glinka. Hello, everyone. Hello, Michael. Hey, I mean, this <laughs> this week's episode is going to be a bit heavy, so everyone sort of brace yourself, and it's go- we're going to tackle some topics that are a bit currently actually quite relevant mm. i would say yes i'd say it's a uh, very much in the zeitgeist uh, but yeah quite quite serious topics so maybe without further ado mm. let's let's start shall we uh, do your predictions we finished chapter seven uh with lilith undergoing the sort of changes that you know to, to help with her memory so uh my predictions were that she will wake up and she'll realize that she can remember things that she has completely forgotten or wanted to forget that that's literally what i wrote down mm. so i think well in terms of you know memory i think i was hit but things to wanted to forget not not so much not so much yeah but yeah she is starting to realize that her, her memory capabilities are different although it doesn't seem to be like she realizes she's speaking owen carly it's kind of a very uh, subtle difference initially yeah yeah, it's actually quite interesting because she starts to speak to Ikanjan uh, and he's just like, oh, you're actually speaking on Kali to me. Mm. Okay. Anyway, uh, let's get to the summary then and then we can discuss sure. this. So, as I mentioned earlier, we start off with um, Lilith awakening, confused but slowly getting back to her normal self. And as she realized with the paralysis wearing off, um, Nikanj enters the room and says to her, oh, you're so complex, while doing something strange to her by touching her face and head with his tentacles, you know? And yeah. um, Just a quick point, like, you're so complex is not a reassuring thing to hear from someone <laughs> who's just been playing around with your brain. Um, so, yeah. yeah, that's... I would 100% agree with this. I, if, somebody, if a neurosurgeon came to me, I was like, and go, yeah, you're so complex. Mm-hmm. Mm. But let's but let's move on. <laughs> and and Nikan tells to her says to her, You're filled with so much life and death and potential for change. And continues to I understand now why some people took so long to get over their fear of your kind. Um which I think is quite interesting. Yeah, I wonder what that sort of biologically might be an allusion to. It could be um the much uh, difference like... between them? There's just a significant yeah, difference. And... I'm not sure, but I, mean, I suppose the, the processes that makes me think of are things like apoptosis and maybe uh, having a, a complex microbiome where you've got lots of stuff that's uh, alive and, and then and dying that's that's part of the the normal t- turnover. Mm. But I, I couldn't see that being much different in the Oankali biology. So I, I, I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. there is some difference. But then again, Oankali, if they wanted to, I don't know, digest anything, like we need bacteria to digest certain things, um, mm. the flora uh, in our gut to, for proper functioning maybe mm-hmm. they don't need it because they can genetically modify themselves to um, properly possibly although I suppose the, the the basis of so much of their technology is in the biology of the organisms with which they kind of surround themselves so maybe they just see themselves as more contiguous with the life that they have kind of around them and it's less separate from them than our microbiomes or they're more aware of it i don't know they have they have trade with it uh in the way that they tend to talk about it yeah and considering the fact that probably well not probably but definitely their lifespan is much much longer than average human being Hmm. then the turnover of their i don't know cells or you know tissue in general is probably is definitely much much shorter compared to humans so that might be also and that's what Nikan is meaning as well, you know, so much life and death because it's you know a bit different. Yeah, that's, that's possible. Yeah, yeah. I say there's kind of a trade-off though in in like the when it comes to the whole aging thing, the like transmitting information forward in time. Like if you have too much turnover, you have a lot of opportunity for introducing errors. But if you don't have enough, then you don't repair things. And there's it's a whole sort of complicated balance. But mm. yeah, that's uh, yeah. yeah. I won't go off on that tangent because that, that'll <laughs> last a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, let's continue. Um, and but alas, after Lilith has 
not clue what he what it meant. Uh, but Nikash tells her eventually maybe it will be able to show her. And hmm. what Nikash was just doing was basically checking if everything is fine by touching her head, you know, just and lives a bit surprised, feeling a little high. Uh, takes a while to understand that she understands, as in mm. understands the Onkali language, and that the fact that she has been speaking to Nikanj all this lo- all this time uh, in Onkali. Yeah, she's been kind of a little bit dissociated through this. She's sort of aware that a bunch of the stuff that Nikanj is saying and doing would normally kind of freak her out, but she's still kind of high from this, whatever they did to put her under. Yeah, and you know. And the fact is that it's interesting because suddenly she even is capable of being able to deduce where the gaps in her knowledge are. So it is, Mm. in fact, being able to remember everything. It's like, you know, as if she suddenly is fluent. And how long has she spent um, so far with Don Kali awake? I'm not sure exactly. I don't know if we have a very exact time frame for that. They don't really have a, as far as I can tell, they don't have a particularly, like, distinct day-night cycle there's not like lighting changes in the environment i think um later on in chapter eight she mentions being awake Mm. i'm not certain now because yeah i think i think she she manages she like adds up in her head how long she's been awake in terms of like the number of times she's slept as it were like the number of subjective days she's experienced but yeah i don't think we actually get a a reckoning of how much that is Mm. but i suppose probably on the order of a few maybe tens of weeks small number of months something like that would be my guess i think you're close although we'll probably have to check later (laughs) yeah if we need to uh, if Mm. we need to anyway so then nikant tells her that it's uh, it's glad that lilith is with her with it um because originally nikant didn't want to work with her try to get out of this whole situation being you know taking care of her and uh, mm. because Nikanj was afraid that it would never be able to convince Lilith to let her trust it enough to let it show its skills. Um, and that we're talking about the memory modification. And mm. Nikanj didn't want to force her opposite to what Kaguya, the asshole, thinks. Uh, you know, as in the new trade partners are not to be treated equally. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I think, a an interesting point to call out in that Kaguya clearly has this attitude towards new trade partners, in this case humans, that's kind of, they're not fully Oankali, as they're not fully persons, you know, we'd say they're not fully human, as it were, this kind of sub-human like, attitude towards them, they're not quite to be treated with the full respect due to a person, as it were. Inferior, basically. It's like a... Yeah, which is not a good attitude. Yeah, and I think... It relates to, I mean, considering the author, uh, Miss Olivia Butler, is black in from nineteen fifty sixties America. I think it's really, um, it's obviously, a message uh, hmm. that relates to what the state the status of America at the time and before. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of kind of notes of of subtextual social commentary throughout these few sections that. Uh, come through subtly in the interactions of the characters it's a, yeah it's, it's a good it's an interesting device through which to explore all of that um you've got this kind of alien context so you can discuss this stuff without having the without discussing the the particulars in the real world which i think is a it's a, it's a good way to to play with the ideas that are relevant but not saying them directly it's sort of you need to think about it. Uh, yeah, I yeah. It, but it's a, in, in divorcing it from the specifics of the reality, you, I think it helps you to think about it mm. because you have this. You, you you don't have the the real framing, as it were. You can think about it in the abstract, detached from the specifics. I think it's a good way to sort of well, good way as long as per, uh, a person who's reading the book actually thinks about it and. Hmm ponders uh, about the con you know the, the the message i think this is a pretty good way for such person to make the connection and relation to what the situation hmm. is like in yeah. in the current real life I, a lot of it i think just it, it, it comes across even if you don't explicitly think about the like, relationship the, the, you know the ideas and how they map onto to our world just the 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 empathy with the various characters or all of the 
attitude that you feel towards the various characters, you know, the, the dislike of Kaguya and so on. It shapes that sort of the way your your thinking fits onto real world examples of the same thing. Mm. It's like a, mm. a, the whole notion of a, of a parable, right? You've got like a story to, to teach a lesson, as it were. Yes. But I need to say, throughout these chapters, I think in a way also we learn and sort of get to like Nikanj more Hmm. considering his attitude because you know he tells her that it would rather go to the Akjai moving away Hmm. from everyone including his mates uh, than coercing her to do something that she didn't want to yes yeah you you learn that uh, Nikanj appears to have a certain strength of convictions when it comes to to not crossing whatever line it's put in its head for um her autonomy mm. i mean it's still pretty coercive but it it's clearly has a, a line it doesn't want to cross and it thinks that kaguya is on the wrong side of it yes yes absolutely but then now it's going back to the summary um mm-hmm. he well it believes that it's different now considering that Lilith underwent that surgery and she trusted it in a way, it can go to Ahajas and Dichang, his two mates, and in fact, it wants Lilith to be there, which is quite interesting because what he say it says is that it wants Lilith to be there, as her touch would be natural, neutral for it, and it wouldn't be sexually stimulated, considering that it would be generally unable to do anything about the sexual arous- arousal. Mm. Um, it's quite strange, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, is, is this? Do they they mention here that the Ahajas and Dishan, um, the mates that uh, Nikanj has? Uh, I think Nikanj is saying he wants Lilith to be there because, like, they'll tease it. Yes, yes. If if uh, if they're there, and uh, it, it doesn't want to be teased by them. Yeah, <laughs> Which, it's, uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. Lilith says thing. that that um, uh, it is quite funny, but Nikanj say, well, it's not funny when you're on the receiving end so and you have nothing to you cannot say anything to that so i guess Mm -hmm. i understand and you know it shows where the sort of sensory organ is and it tells Mm -hmm. it's actually growing but it's hidden and um (laughs) nikanj tells her that it will show her once it matures (laughs) (laughs) yeah actually there's a bit where um she uh, he says that Kaguya would show her if she asked, and she's like, mm, uh, "Yeah, no." That's the <laughs> so last thing exactly she would want, want the... I think. <laughs> yeah, that's a, no, that's a definite. Uh, not interested in that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and mm. the chapter ends with basically Lilith agreeing with Nikanj, and that she will f- uh, feed it when it's awake. Hmm. But before that whole situation takes place Nikanj will f- try to find an English speaking human for her and that's where we end mm. this chapter Yeah, and I just wanted to, to go back to this whole, so you know, Nikanj is going to be undergoing this final metamorphosis, which the final bit implies, there might have been some previous ones, um, to become like a, a sexually mature Uloi but interesting that it already has partners, right? it already has a, a male and female Ahajas and Dishan. Uh, yeah, so just a, an interesting bit about their their biology and their kind of sexual politics um, and how that's all organized. I think later on, I don't remember which chapter, uh, Nikanj mm-hmm. tells uh, Lilith that in fact um, the mate, the male and female, um, mm. are usually brother and sister that are um, be- that become mates with the. Uloi and the Uloi is actually the um, I don't remember the translation I think it's later on but basically it means that the favorable um, or like the basically they're happy to have the Uloi coming to their uh, you know the part as a partner because it brings extra like I think it comes to in, in meaning the genetic um, variety mm-hmm. I think and it I think it mentions that I think later on it is maybe my earlier um and then which is I think interesting but we'll come back hmm. to that I think this is yeah, yeah. as that comes up I think we'll, we'll revisit it mm-hmm. but yeah as, as, as it was interesting to me that the uh, Nick Hanges has sort of selected some partners prior to reaching its its sexual maturity mm. 
mm. kind of thing. Humans don't usually do it that way around. Well, you mentioned uh, you suspect there were other metamorphoses taking place. Maybe before there was some other step that includes the male and female Onkali. Yeah, the the um the sort of whatever their first metamorphosis step is, because uh, or whatever the prior multiple steps possibly depending on we just had this is his final metamorphosis so i suppose we don't know what went before that but yeah it would be interesting to to learn more about how they um how they grow up like how many metamorphoses do they undergo and what are the um sort of implications socially for their their um maturity and, and what, how they're treated because it is clear that uh you know kaguya and, and so on are still and treating Nikanj as, as a child in some ways. Yes. Um, uh, trying to help it to uh, uh, grow up in ways that they think are, are best for it and so on. But I think this this is going this is the, the treating Nikanj as a child is going to bite them back, as we'll see in hmm. the next chapter, I think. Yes. So sh- shall we do your, your predictions for the for the subsequent chapter? Sure. So I wrote that um Lilith will meet a human, probably male, and mm-hmm. that he will tell Lilith something that really startles her, that he knows something that will really spook her. So I'd, I'd say that's probably accurate. I think yeah. it's I think it's really <laughs> accurate in some context. Yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, should we launch into the summary of this? Yeah. yeah, so just for all our listeners, please bear in mind this chapter goes into quite heavy, I would say, situation and dust mm-hmm reach some top topics that you know can be a bit sensitive so please bear that in mind yeah so the chapter starts with a bit of insight to the new ability that Lilith acquired the ability being being able to remember everything when she's awake so as you mentioned Richard earlier she literally is capable of counting now what times when she's awake and mm. mem- rem- remember everything basically yeah that actually sounds like a pretty great ability to have, to be honest. I'm very jealous, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and then finally, Kaguya finds a human for Lilith uh, with with the decision and with the decision that Nikanj agrees that the man um, with a man who decided to stay with the Onkali in the Toacht family, mm-hmm. and a man that was awakened at a young age of fourteen. So the yeah. next scene. We see Lilith and uh, Nikanj ride through the ship on the flat transports towards their destination. And when they arrive, Nikanj sends it back. And when Lilith asks what we need to go back, she, you know, Nikanj goes, well, we'll get another, but maybe you'll just want to stay here a while, which sends sort of red flag uh, in Lily's uh, head. You know, what was this? You know, step two of the captive breeding program, she thinks. Hmm. She thought that if the male was thoroughly separated from the humanity, who knows what he will do. Which is quite a, um, I would say, prediction in here. Yeah, there's definitely a little bit of foreshadowing in that sentiment. Yeah, but it seems that Nikon doesn't, doesn't get what her, so I don't know, maybe facial expression or her body language is, because it mistakes her looking around thinking that she was curious about the transport and it tells her mm. that's an actual animal a tilio, uh that releases slime and sucks most of it at the back which i think is yeah. quite interesting like because i thought you know initially in the first three episode two or three when we f- are first introduced with those sort of moving platforms when we see them moving i thought they were yeah. like some sort of anti-gravity but now i understand yeah. that everything is an organism in there Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were kind of way off base with the whole um, like superconductivity yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was way off, no. way off tangent. So this is evidence that I don't have Lilith's memory because I'd kind of forgotten this explanation about how this whole thing worked and was off speculating sincerely about the <laughs> the anti grav. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so interesting because you know it's Lilith calls it like oh it's like a snail. But hmm. it's not really because it's like a flat animal that basically moves by releasing slime and then recycling it, most of it at least. Um, yeah, and what... the rest is taken up by the ship. But uh, it's quite I'm not sure about the physics of that. But uh, yeah, it is an interesting idea, right? the notion of a, of a transport based on like uh, the same kind of locomotion, roughly, as a, as a gastropod. Right? 
slime layer and then just sort of pulling yourself along the surface of it. I just wonder yeah. what um, sort of planet would that such organism come from, you know, the, the necessity mm. of a, for evolution to produce... I mean, we do have snails and slugs, obviously, hmm. um, but an animal that needs to re- recycle uh, also. Uh, hmm. I guess unless this was genetically modified by the onca. Yeah. But... So how how much of the current biology is original to its wherever it evolved in its niche, and how much has been subsequently selected and engineered by the onca? So that's uh, uh, probably we'll never know the answer to this. Yeah. Uh, but I think it'll be if I would speculate something, I would say that if there is a environment that it requires for the sli- for the animal to recycle the slime, that has to mm. be very limited access to water or mm, other be. compounds that are required to produce the slime. But it'd be interesting to uh Yeah, but maybe even just like um sugars. So I mean things like um and a hagfish and a few other things that produce crazy slimes mm. they have like a kind of sugar base or some complex sugars structures sort of glycans um that form like hydrogels um so they excrete something with this complicated glycan structure and then it gets hydrated by the water around it to form the slime so it sucks up a huge amount of water ah, yes. so it could be a, a water shortage or an issue with producing whatever it is that, that sort of wicks up the water i completely forgot about those fish yeah the hagfish they're super weird yeah, um, I remember seeing a video of like somebody trying to grab it and basically just covering slime. Yeah, it's like instantaneously transforms a huge volume of water around it into this sticky, viscous, transparent slime, um, and everything just gets stuck in it. It's a pretty astonishing in the like a volume of water that it's able to very rapidly convert into this viscous substance from a very small secretion. Man, evolution is crazy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, comes up with some wacky stuff. No. So when continuing about the Tilio, when asked by mm-hmm. Don Kali, don't use machinery, uh, Nikant tells uh, her, Lilith that they don't like it because there is no trade. And this mm-hmm. is actually goes back to what we originally discussed about, you know, the necessity of the trade, that it's so ingrained in them. It's like their primary, I would say, like for us, yeah. reproduction, you know, the passing on our dna is like the, our primary you know reason why we live because that's the reason you know dna does the only it's evolution's utility function right and it's make more and optimize the process of doing it exactly yeah. so i wonder the trade must be also on the same level of you know hmm. yeah because it, it seems to be really ingrained in their their biology they have a need to participate in this to to acquire new biological functions which is, uh, and, and in some ways, very much like um, you know what we do, and a, a good part of like, the reason why we think sex evolved is to generate diversity uh, upon which selection can act. It's uh, useful to have that that uh, you know diversity of function so you can find a, a, a you know a niche into which um, that function works. Right, mm. it's uh, generating raw material for selection. Um, so I suppose it might be a similar thing here. They can acquire new function from outside themselves um so instead of just sex with within the population they they pull in genetic resources from outside of it it's fascinating i think it's fascinating the Mm. idea behind you know that evolution can stimulate um organisms to need to uh share uh, genetic information between different like species between different planets in fact even yeah so what what are the i think one of the themes that is explored in the background here is certainly um, like uh, biological determinism and, and the balance between nature and nurture. There's a lot of um, points where the like the, the behavior of the Owen Carly seems to be very much explained by their biology. Uh, they're, they're, they're shaped in their motivations by it. But uh, later on in this chapter, I think we get uh, some stuff about the importance of, of culture. That's what we'll come back to. But it's yeah, there's a definite exploration of that balance going on in the air as well. Yes, yes. But let's go back to that, because uh, I think this is the big part of the chapter now mm-hmm. where we finally, finally meet another human. And so we learn the name of the human, Paul Titus. Um, and it starts with Nikanj uh, takes Lilith to a nearby wall, one of the streets, and, straight, and touching it with... Um, 
long, three long head tentacles. And the wall changes, instead of opening, it changes the color from white to dull red, uh, but not opening. And this is like the version of the Onkali knocking the door on the door, ringing the bell. And finally, we meet our second human. And this is what the description in the book says. A human being, tall, stocky, as dark as she was, clean shaved. He looked wrong to her at first, alien yet and strange, yet familiar, compelling. He was beautiful. Even if he had been bent and old, he would have been beautiful. Um, they get introduced and invited to the house. Um, and the first question Lilith asked was, have you really decided to stay here? <laughs> Which is yeah, which wasn't <laughs> what she was intending to ask first, but it kind of slipped out, right? She's, yeah, she's very incredulous about the fact that he's okay with this. It's no hello, no hi, no. What's your name? Just immediately, have you really decided to stay here? I think she does like give her name, but that's about it. Yes, yes, yeah. We learned that like her, his family died, and he were and he was awakened early. He doesn't remember how Don Kali found him, and neither does Lilith. And when prompted by Lilith, Nikanj tells them that, in fact, they Don Kali made humans to forget, because the first mm. humans who were allowed to remember died in spite of their care. Uh, which I think is not surprising, considering the shock. Yeah, I say that you're you're already in what's evidently some kind of post nuclear apocalypse, and then a bunch of crazy botanical alien shows up and abduct you um yeah that's that's gonna be um destabilizing i would say more than that <laughs> considering the fact that you know that, as you said new nuclear, nuclear fire there's nothing to come back probably most of you people you know and love died and now you're staring mm. at a weird alien telling you all of this and wants to trade with you um mm. yes definitely this is i would say it's I think the pure shock would be enough to, for people to, to just die. But anyway, mm. the conversation continues uh, uh, on with Paul and Lilith trying to get to know each other. We learned that Lilith majored in anthropology, uh, which made uh, Paul say, oh yeah, I remember reading some stuff by Margaret Mead before the war. And I think it's another foreshadowing of things. Yeah, it's a pretty subtle one, I think. There's a bit of a, a reference. I'm not sure how popular Margaret Mead would have been with, with 14-year-old boys. Maybe I'm, I don't know, I don't know how much she was in the, the zeitgeist when, when Paul was growing up. But it Depends what, um, what, yeah, I guess that's this whole war started. Because, I mean, to mm. be honest, I haven't heard of Margaret Mead until you told me, uh, until I read, actually, and then you told me a bit more about her, so... Yeah, she kind of stuck out to me uh, as a as a callback that was relevant to later events. Mm. And then we learned that Liv was uh, from Los Angeles and Paul was from Denver. And when the war started, Paul was in the Grand Canyon, whereas uh, Liv was in Andes, uh, Peru, uh, hiking towards Machu Picchu. And mm. Liv tells that Paul, that her family was killed before the war. Um, as well as the friend who told her to move away from everything after her family's death. And this mm. actually, we learn a bit more about the state of Earth after the war, that the he southern hemisphere was not as, as, as affected as the northern hemisphere, as the mm -hmm. ice ages was more patchy at the south of the planet. And in fact, they speculate that maybe some of the humans survived in those patches mm. that didn't freeze over yeah yeah there was evidently some kind of uh, nuclear winter that uh, took place um it seems like a lot of the people who survived this were in remote places when the bombs dropped which makes sense all those guys who always you know people laugh at that you know why do you have a shack somewhere a house somewhere with uh, far away you know the, the prepping for a nuclear yep yeah. now they all make sense <laughs> yeah uh, the the prep is always uh Come out with a win whenever there's a disaster scenario, yes. right? <laughs> I told you, man. So when Lily turns around to ask Nikanj about the fa this fact, the fact people may be surviving, we find that it's gone. And Lily worried, but Paul tells her that in fact it can op uh, that you know, he's been gone for a while and that Paul can open the doors as they modified him to be able to do so when he decides to stay. Mm. They both joke in a way about the Onkali observing them all the time. And then Paul says to her, 
maybe he thought we might be kind of inhibited if he stayed around. And as a first warning sign, a first warning sign now, uh, mm. which Lilith is aware but ignores it. Yeah, yeah, she can. She's definitely getting a, a the vibe off of him off the bat with that statement. And Lilith refutes, saying that Nikanj is an Uloi, not a male. And Paul goes, "Yeah, I know, but doesn't Yuri seem male to you?" And as she thought about it, no, I guess I've taken their word for what they are and to what Paul responds when they woke me up I thought the Uloi acted like men and women while the males and females act like, like eunuchs hmm. uh, is that how they pro- correctly pronounce it? eunuchs? yeah eunuchs, eunuchs. yeah yeah. I'm pretty sure that's, that's correct I, um, I never really lost the habit of thinking of Uloi as male or female I do agree a bit I think we can't is, act as more like a male to be honest hmm. I wonder if that's just the sort of a counterpart of, of him and Lilith. I, I don't know. But yeah, I, I think I I may have, I've noticed us occasionally gendering him. Yes, yes. I keep catching oh, I, myself. I, I just did it then, him. Yeah. I think it's also <laughs> it. the fact the right. name Nikanj, mm-hmm. like, I don't know, it Nicholas or something along those lines. Yeah. It just sounds male. A bit, but uh, I think that's that's somewhat culturally specific, isn't it? The particular, like, like, um, like O and A things on the end of names that varies depending on the the language but uh yeah yeah and i think that there's a distinction there between um the different definitions of gender right there's the the um the oh, was it the radical feminist definition of gender wherein it's kind of a cultural framework um or, or like expectations of gender roles and then there's the liberal feminist definition wherein it's um a question of self-identity and it's sort of from the from the liberal camp that you have the um like uh, the the proliferate, proliferation of large numbers of different gender identities, whereas the the slightly older radical camp is more uh, about like uh, breaking apart existing gender stereotype rules and uh, as gender as a or gender roles as a as a framework of oppression. The different perspectives on that definition mm-hmm. are kind of encapsulated in that little exchange there. In that uh, Lilith is kind of taking the the liberal angle on um, how. Nikanj is self-identifying, whereas Paul is taking the the, the radical definition, wherein it's, it's like the behavior conforming to a particular stereotype. Yeah, I guess you're right in here because the fact that you know he um, compares, well, he looks at it as there's only males and females, and then basically doesn't allow for anything um, in between or anything of so mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. indicate that confirms that no but then it's the difference in here is that this is all related to the genetics right hmm. whereas um for humans this is more also the well this topic is way beyond my scope to even discuss because i do not possess enough knowledge of psychology and also you know the effects of brain you know we are aware that we need to there are some hormonal levels as well that can affect people's um, a perception of their own gender. But you know, mm. this is this is yeah. I think this is more complex. The than distinction this. between biological sex and gender it, it becomes a very complex problem, and there, there are numerous you know, biological underpinnings of this stuff. And you know, it's, it's clear that the population is bimodal with respect to sexual characteristics, but there are definitely intermediate states at lower frequency. I think, yeah, well, purely from a human perspective, um, obviously the biological sex, we have, you know, XY and XX chromosomes, which makes us male and female, right? Um, there are some very minor mutations in the X chromosomes or the Y chromosomes where you get extra copy of it, but these are super rare, I would say. Relatively, yeah. And then you get things like androgen insensitivities, where you can be X, Y, but present female in basically every respect because um, you don't have the receptors to receive the testosterone. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of complicated exactly. um, biological sex determining things that um, can lead to, to uh, like in- inverted genetic and external presentation and then a whole bunch of different intersex sort of developmental disorders. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because you would think that in a way to preserve, to ensure that this continuation of DNA, you know, of DNA spreading further down the line, that the biological sex would be 
um, and identi- and the identity of a male as a female would be a sort of sure proof thing, right? But mm. the modific but the changes and the problems that so arise from, as you said, you no know, lack of the reduced effect of the hormones on your body, the I don't know in lack of um effect and also i mean let's be honest we had the discussion about the brain last episode mm-hmm. and we still don't understand how brain develops and how it reacts you know to so you know we know understand the effects certain hormones affected but how what's the threshold for it to actually you know and then how it affects our mm-hmm. identities you know it's it's yeah yeah there's a there's a continuum in, in those things both um biologically and sort of uh, psychologically and socially and I think particularly in, in humans because we're such a, a social species and because our functions are kind of um or like are, are, are relevant to the survival of of the offspring of other members of the population is is often relevant right yes. so we, we can have things like the non-binary or homosexual members of the of the population that are still like uh, effectively contributing to the fitness of the offspring potentially so there's m- maybe less selection pressure mm-hmm. against that kind of um like uh, non-canonical uh, sex identities in in human population than there might be in an animal reproductive population i think it'd be nice to have someone to actually has a psychologist to discuss this about because mm-hmm. um or a specialist in this, in this uh, field because i think it is a very broad and difficult topic to discuss just on based we we possess certain knowledge about yeah the biology stuff we know a bit about that but uh, but the psychology part and the social uh eff, you know effects especially in different cultures mm. um i mean because both come from western mm-hmm. culture in a way yeah the the um indian subcontinent culture with respect to this stuff is very interesting i remember uh if i can interrupt you i remember there was somewhere in one of the islands in southern hemisphere um one of the cultures has in effect a way of men being uh, go like transgender men basically men becoming females but it's so ingrained in their culture that it's basically like a third sort of gender okay, in itself, i'm unfamiliar with that particular I think. example but... i need to look at it uh, look it up because it just this conversation just, you know, somehow reshuffled mm. my memory and uh, made me remember this. I remember reading it somewhere and I will try to find the references. If I'm wrong, I apologize. But if I'm right, I'll definitely find the references for it. But, yeah, let's return but anyway, to let's the... maybe move on. <laughs> Where are we up to? Yes. So Paul warns her that once Nikanj grows the sexual organs, its behavior will change. And Lilith tells that tells Paul that she will help Nikan through its metamorphosis and Paul tells her, well, if that's the case, it means that it trusts her and it, it will put it in debt to her. So it's a good thing to have. Mm. And then Paul, sort of the, the conversation continues while Paul um, gives little food and she's surprised because it fi- she finds it that it's made all from the plant material that she eats and uh, when Liv tells him about cassavas. He asks her if she really thought how it will be when it's sent uh, when she's mm. sent back to Earth. You know, a literal Stone Age, digging in the ground with a stick for roots, may beating bugs, rats. Rats survived, I heard. Cattle and horses didn't. Dogs didn't, mm. but rats did. Just the 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 reason she was confused about the the food is that it kind of it resembles like oh, it's a burger and chips or something or a sandwich or both, um, but it's made of the same yes, raw yes, material. Yes. As the stuff that she's been eating, um, but like she hadn't thought to ask for it to be made to look familiar, as it were. Apparently, Paul did. Mm. I guess, yeah. He says that he really misses mm. a burger, like a proper, you know, with cheese. And it's a shame, isn't it? God, I would probably die if I couldn't eat. But then again, you're a no, no. Vegan, I'm not, so... not a vegan. I'm a lacto ovo vegetarian. Ah, um, not fully. So I, I've, I've yet to kick okay. the, the, the milk and eggs and cheese. <laughs> I think this is the biggest thing for vegetarian people going vegan. Yeah, the yeah cheese. I, I really like cheese and milk, frankly. And, and yogurt. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of stuff that's part of my diet as like staples that I'd, I'd need to seriously change to properly go vegan. It'd be mm. difficult, wouldn't it? Be? But then yeah. people manage to do it. 
But anyway, he implicates that considering that she had a son, uh, you know, she was surrounded by doctors and when she is on Earth, back on Earth again, this won't happen. So there won't be any medicine or painkillers. And this argument continues on about what the bombs haven't done that Aunt Carly will finish, Mm. i.e. the genocide. Eventually, Paul suggests maybe she could stay with him, you know, and but gets a hard no. I mean, so far, I don't think anybody would work. Like, with this all the media. stuff about um, not having doctors around for childbirth doesn't really land that well with Lilith because apparently she uh, didn't have any trouble with that. Yeah, I, I think she was. A, it was a birthing center somewhere where, but yeah, it was a, a, a fairly non-medicalized environment. By the sounds of it, I honestly personally don't understand this decision like i mean no i i understand what she puts in there because she says that that she doesn't want to feel like a patient in Hmm. a way like you know just um in the sterile environment but that's the whole purpose of the hospital a sterile environment so that in case anything yeah i I suppose it's the there is someone to help her like um like sterile from a, a clinical perspective and sterile from like a an emotional perspective almost as it were uh you know, I can and I can empathize True. with the not wanting to to excessively medicalize the process unless you're you know like I mean it ma- it makes sense to me to do it in somewhere like where she did it right a, a birthing center where presumably the emergency medicine is on hand um, but like you're mm-hmm. not forced to be in that very uh, emergency medicine like environment which is uh, stressful in and of itself. Right? Um, and you know, childbirth is stressful enough, right? I said she had a, a, a easy time of it, but like that's not, you know, relatively speaking, right? The process is always extremely difficult, especially for humans. We're we're really not very good at it. I think this is, I mean, you know, this whole concept. Uh, I understand, you know, Paul's point of view as well, because the fact that a lot of ch- death at childbirth oh, yeah. situation is because well, a lot of women. What happens is that the uh, pelvis doesn't grow wide enough. The, the the hole in the pelvis where the baby is supposed to go is not big enough. So often um, what happened was women die with the baby stuck mm. in the canal, uterine canal, which is hor- yeah. horrible, I think. for It's just... And I remember reading upon this and there was a case as they found a skeleton of a woman who had a skeleton basically mm. inside of her basically baby just it's just like well, we had a it's... um a weird evolutionary trade-off in our history wherein our you know, prime function as a like our, our main niche is our intelligence right we we need, we need big brains to to cooperate yes. with one another um and so on and that means larger heads um but that means larger pelvic openings to fit the heads through um but we're bipedal which is a problem for making pelvises wider so like beyond a certain point it's difficult to run effectively with a wide pelvis um so we have this kind of uh, pressure to be born younger and and we're particularly vulnerable as infants um be- because we have this this trade-off yes. of of being like born super early so that we can get through a, a pelvis that's narrow enough to run with but wide enough to let our heads through so it's this uh which means that childbirth is uh very unpleasant for human females more so than it is for many other species it's such a weird thing isn't it like evolution got <laughs> drunk in there and i feel sorry for all the women that underwent and i will undergo childbirth because it's going mm. to be painful and i'm not gonna experience it and i'm happy mm. because of that but I am fully 100% supporting <laughs> all the women who uh, decided or not decided to do it because bloody yeah. hell, I can understand not wanting to undergo that yeah, process. Definitely. So here we go with this chapter where things go mm-hmm. wrong because we, you know, Paul suggests uh, to Lou that she could stay with him but gets a hard no. And he says to her then that they expect her to say no and that she should rebel. And then things go wrong here. He starts to become a bit forceful. His grip painful on her shoulders as he speaks to her. But he lets go and says that she should she would be safe here. That the condition on the earth would be awful and she would be put in a harem, uh, being beaten, etc. You know, all the nice stuff that was during medieval yep. times. Um, and then 
again he takes her sh- by her shoulders and tries to awkwardly kiss her and Lifra Jaskin fights off that she doesn't want to make a show no matter what and uh, and she doesn't want uh, she just doesn't want it and the other thing I'm not interested in doing is giving them a human mm. child to tamper with and this is where I think Paul drops a big bomb that I wasn't expecting yeah, yeah, there's a kind in this of chapter strange interlude here where he's like started getting handsy with her but then they break off to have this conversation about this whole thing about parenthood and the way the Owen call it yeah yeah so he says you probably already have and he tells that that there might have been not enough humans on earth to trace so they forced pregnancies on women and maybe incubate the human fetuses in one of the animals they have and he tells her that he fathered 70 children but never seen a woman until now i don't think he's met any of those children either I think, yeah. No, no, I don't think so. And it's this is where I think this chapter, this is one part of this chapter, but I think this is really, really mm. messed up. In yeah, a way. I think it definitely uh, like speaks to some of his insecurities. That, like the, the fact that they've told him about him being a father to all of these kids and him never having met them and never having had sex. It's it's very strange. I wonder if he even was aware that they took his biological so. tissue, or just sperm, or ju- was it just biological tissue to you know for an in vitro fertilization or whatever it was? But it doesn't produce a nice image mm. in my head. Actually, in fact, my imagination now is going to places where it shouldn't have, and I'm really regretting it. But um, it just puts in perspective that the Onkali really don't understand the humans and the, how social we are and the, the necessity of being able to um, be in contact mm. with another human being, especially, you know, put op- opposite sex or at least the sex mm. you're uh, attracted to. But anyway, the chapter goes even down the spiral uh, from there. He, Paul stares at her after telling her for several seconds that, and she feared him and pitied him. I longed to be away from her and the first human being she had seen in years and all she could think was to mm. be away from him. And then things go even worse from there. Paul tears her jacket off and tries to do the same with the pants and then it fights off. When, but when she realizes she has no strength to fight considering how tall and strong he was and as being cornered, she tries to mentally stop him, making him imagine if she was his sister or mother. And when mother is mentioned, the possibility that maybe his sperm was used with his mother, Paul hits her. I think this is where it, his fears really were, li- were yeah. lying. And he says he had never had sex before and thought he could do it with her because they said, they mm-hmm. said he could. But she ruined it and the, the chapter ends with her being kicked to unconsciousness. Yeah. So uh, attempted rape and beating. Yeah, not a great... Tenere assault, yeah. physical assault, and and the worst part is they told him that, you know, he mm. could do it. Like, as in the Onkali told him his family, and uh, that's fucking yeah. messed up. Although, I, it's not entirely clear if they told him that he could have, as in, like, he could have sex with her irrespective of her consent, or whether or not he said he could have sex with her, like, if if she was okay with it, right? There was the potential that they might have sex. But still, a pretty um, weird setup, right? Yes, it's, I think, like, basically breeding... Although not really breeding as such, you know, as, as, as we... Actually, well, yeah, I suppose that's that's from the, the next chapter, but uh, we'll leave that there. But, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it's, I, I feel like it, it's just like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I I just felt this this was a really I I as I mentioned many times before I have never ever idea nowadays where this where the chapters are going. One second we look for, with Lilith looking for a human around, and the second we have we meet a human being that tries to rape her. Yep. Yeah, it's not not a great first encounter with another member of her species, to say the very least. Um, but I think it's uh, in many ways pretty predictable. Right, because I mean, and I think that yeah. this whole little narrative with um, Paul is kind of a a, a, a parable for, or um, like what, what the effects are of of a, a cultural genocide. Right, because he's effectively mm-hmm. the victim of a cultural genocide uh, in that he has been completely cut off from all of his heritage. Right, there's no human 
to mentor him. He has no concept of human yes. culture as a, as a man, right? He has no uh, male um, uh, mentors, no role models. Um, and he's been sort of kept isolated with these aliens whose approach towards dealing with him has, as it is with Lilith is very coercive. Right, that's the behavior he's seen modeled yes. by everyone around him. Is coercion is acceptable, um, and you know, so from from fourteen, you know, they're still you know very young, very much being shaped by the, the culture that surrounds him. So having been cut off from that, it, it's kind of unsurprising the way that he acts here, and you know, the, yeah. the, the foreshadowing yeah. almost of it with with Lilith, she you know wondered explicitly what exactly does it do to someone who's been raised with the Owen Carly for, from the age of 14 before she goes to meet him. And I think it, that whole narrative is, pro, is distinctly a, like a, an analogy towards uh, you know, the uh, slavery in, in the US, right? And the, the plight of, of uh, yeah, black American men in that context, right? They're, they're, they're cut off from the culture. Um, originally when they brought slaves over to the states you know that they deliberately like segregated the language groups so they couldn't communicate with one another and pass on what would have been cultural knowledge from their original heritage and then the situation is perpetuated and then even to this day with the, the in, in, uh, disproportionate incarceration of, of african-american men uh, which you know, deprives people in those communities of role models and and this kind of uh, behavior results from it to a significant degree not to absolve you know, uh, Paul of moral responsibility here at least not in you know not not in full oh, right no, you know, no. it's clearly completely reprehensible but the the, the consequences of this lack of um, a lack of, of structure for people results in this kind of suffering for for, for the, the, the the women with whom they interact it's a, it's a very sad and unfortunate narrative yeah I mean it's I think yeah, I absolutely agree. If this Paul's behavior obviously mm. is not acceptable, uh, is unacceptable. But at the same time, it's, it is a a sort of a mirror, not a mirror image, but more mm. of like a shadow of what America and slaves that were taken to America underwent. And there's kind of a, an, an inclination to be like morally, you know, judgmental of people's reprehensible behavior. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm not. I don't really believe in in free will as such, and nor in particular in, in moral judgments. But I think you know, accountability is useful for the purposes of, of, of laws and so on. But thinking about their behaviour in terms of you know, what are the actually underlying causes is, uh, I think, a, a useful frame because it's in, in that way that you can learn to address it, right? And people don't come out of the box with good moral, like cultural norms. Right, we don't have a we we we're pretty, mm -hmm. and we have a little bit, but we're relatively blank slates to some degree. Right, there's there's quite a lot of biological influences, but we're very plastic. Right, it's one of the features of humans that it, it, that is our advantage that permits us to be, um, you know, well adapted to to basically every place on Earth where you can grow plants, we can live, and maybe even a few that you don't in the far north. Right, um, that plasticity. Mm -hmm. um, the environmental sensitivity permits us uh, to be shaped very much by our environment. So, like the potential for bad behaviour is close beneath the surface if we don't have the right environment. Uh, and a lot of the um, and and even civilization in, is pretty brittle in that regard. And if you look at all the lessons that were drawn in the aftermath of various forms of totalitarianism, mm -hmm. you know, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. And, Hannah Arendt's work and, and some other stuff, like uh, Travelers in the Third Reich, more recent book, all, all those books about kind of how normal people ended up doing morally reprehensible things uh, because they had the right environmental conditions. Right? Put someone in the right conditions and they will do bad stuff. Yeah. No, you're absolutely correct. You know, it's even though in general, I think most people don't, I mean, as society is now. As long as the environment around you does, you know, is in a way mm. acceptable, in a way, in in terms of um, there's laws and order, and you know, the community sort of mm. sticks together mm. more or less. It doesn't happen that often, 
but I agree that the moment the situation changes, the moment, for example, if we did have a nuclear war and nuclear winter follow up with that, all those laws and order would yeah. completely disappear and everybody would be for themselves and only those we, I don't know, I don't know, it'd be hard for anybody to trust anyone, even the closest mm. friends and family members, because who knows what The veneer of civilization is, is very thin. Right. And the and part of why I think it's sort of important to understand these structural causes for people's um, bad behavior is that you can um, thicken that veneer, right? Uh, if you understand why people act the way they act, you can set things up so that it's more difficult, and that the like so it's easier, right? So so you you fall into the to correct or a better way of behaving mm -hmm. as a kind of that's like the mm -hmm. the attractor state, the low energy state, right? The easiest thing to do is to do the right thing, because people will fall into doing whatever the easiest thing to do is, irrespective of what that is. So if you understand how. Uh, the things shape people to do behave in certain ways then you can set up your civilization in such a fashion as, as to to make it the 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 low energy state right where people will fall into if if mm. left uh, to their own devices yeah no i agree and but i th yeah it's it's i in a way i'm glad that i was born in a western culture and being able to live relatively calm life uh in a society that protects and stays together in the world you know because i just i sometimes imagine myself you know back in the medieval times well, i mean this things happens nowadays mm. so it's not really like i have to go back to middle but at the time where the moment there's any war and there's no as this fa famine and there's no food supply and then you have to and your fa your family your and your family survival is depends on if you have to do an awful thing i mean if you put yourself in the shoes of that, those people there's a very low number of people um that would have the strength mm. And of their will to to not to yeah. take I, steps. I think you know people overestimate the, the the likely degree of their own moral fortitude in in the face of coercion and uh, you know, it's the how many of us would actually you know stand up and and you know, hide the Jews in our basement in Nazi Germany right it's a it's, it's taking a risk oh, yeah. that many people will not take yeah and it's 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 a heavy topic and I think this is I just realized that. Uh, we never circled back on the Margaret Mead thing, but it's kind of relevant to the um, the sort of stuff I was just saying about culture. In that um, uh, Margaret Mead was a student student of uh, of Franz Boas, who was kind of the originator of the the notion of cultural relativism, um, which at, at the time, mm -hmm. kind of the turn of the twentieth century, was was a much needed concept in anthropology because before that it was very kind of uh, Victorian and like judgmental, um, and it, can you explain sort of more about the culture yeah, so, if you can? I mean, the, and the, the framework approach. is effectively um, like analyzing people's behavior in terms of their own cultural context, right? Uh, so it, it, it used to be that, you know, the, the early anthropologists went to a tribe and were very kind of like, you know, they had their, their Christian moral framework from, from you know, the, the, the West and they would like very sort of judgmentally analyze and, you know, talk in terms of, you know, primitives and all this kind of very condescending language towards um, tribal cultures and the like. Um, but mm -hmm. the concept of cultural relativism was like it stopped trying to apply those cultural norms to the people in these other societies and assess them by their own merits, right? Understand how their moral thinking works, understand how their cultural norms function from the perspective of someone within that culture. Uh, and that was you know, a, a very effective an important tool in progressing anthropology. It's since been rather misused mm -hmm. in certain contexts, but uh, it is, uh, you know, at the time it was quite useful in that specific context. And uh, you know, there's kind of a, there's a little uh, a case with with Mead, uh, where she wrote this book, Coming of Age in, in Samoa, that described the kind of relatively liberal sexual culture of the these tribal groups in, in Samoa. And then she was criticized after her, her death by a, a guy called Derek Freeman, who, who had gone and done field work and said that, no, this wasn't the case. They weren't 
uh, they didn't have this this uh, liberal sexuality in the Samoan group. But after Mead had been there, a bunch of Christian missionaries had also been involved. So the culture had been changed from when she made her observations to when um, uh, Freeman made his. Um, so that whole importance of culture and that uh, it seems to come full circle there. It's a, it, it, you know, she observed this, and then it was changed by the fact that these. You know, Christians came in and then kind of like influenced or or uh, uh, um, changed the culture of these other people, mm, and mm. It's relevant to this other context. You know, the Owen Carly are coming in and changing bits of human culture. I think also I've read about this um, Samoan culture and um, the fact of Margaret Mead and Derek Freeman. And to be honest, I feel like slightly feel a bit that Derek Freeman was a bit cheeky in terms of doing all that criticism after her yeah, death that's um like when you cannot defend yourself or you're a pro you know you can't argue uh mm. your criticism then you know it's like why didn't he do it earlier i mean i don't know i haven't checked when he started the timeline whether but, it was too late for but if it was if he already was an anthropologist and before her death then why didn't he argue with you know her arguments when she was still able to hmm. contra argue hmm. but then again you know it's it's an important lesson as well for future scientists in general and people that if you have any ideas prepare yourself that maybe one day somebody's gonna uh is going to uh, argue them after <laughs> your death yeah well yeah it's uh, always the way isn't it yeah. people will uh criticize ideas which is part of the process right although often uh not all the criticism is valid <laughs> absolutely it's about surviving the the criticism uh, of whatever quality <laughs> so that uh, you can uh, yes uh, whittle away the untruths and leave the uh, the kernel of truth left well should we go to my predictions for the chapter yes nine? Let's, uh, I'm going to that. um so the chapter will start with i think um, Lilith waking up and being super ang- well, first of all, mm-hmm. in pain, and secondly, super angry at the Kaj and Kaguya for choosing a human, uh, for her thinking that they will mate and that she will be feel betrayed by Nikanj. That that was my prediction. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly, in her situation, I would I think that I would also feel betrayed as mm-hmm. hell. If if I ended up in such situation, yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, once again, Lilith has, has not had a particularly pleasant experience in the the uh, under the auspices of the Owen Carly. It's uh, she's yeah she's had a hard life, right? She's been subjected to a huge uh, quantity of very difficult experiences. Yeah, she went through her hurdles, and now she has to go through yeah. even more. Although she has. As um, Paul pointed out, one of the things that, that um, as you predicted, would, would be shocking to Lilith was, I think you said something like, how many women did they go through before they found you? Uh, you have you, you probably yeah. match yeah. what they expect and what they want of a, of a human far more exactly than you appreciate, um, to paraphrase. And, and she was like really struck by that. She's like, yeah, they know exactly how to manipulate me. They, they know they know what i'm going to do the uh she's like aware of of that uh aspect of it but kind of powerless to do much about it and yeah uh, she's kind of angry um about that and resentful which is entirely understandable uh, no absolutely absolutely i mean they they found a yeah. hard woman a hard person Very strong who person. survived a lot of thing and she survived a lot but they know Absolutely. how to yeah, how they, to they, manipulate. They picked her because of her fairly extraordinary resiliency, because they knew that they would be subjecting her to some stuff that would require extraordinary resiliency, which is yeah, messed up. It is messed up. But anyway, I think should we finish here? Yes, that's uh, <laughs> on, yeah. this, on this note. <laughs> uh, on a, on a not very cheerful note, this chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for everyone for listening. We are Xenothesis. You can find all different sort of places where we post our uh, episodes um, on xenothesis.com. And I was Michael Glinka. I was Richard Axon. And, uh, goodbye. and goodbye, everyone. <laughs>